Good evening and welcome to tonight's Facebook Live with Breast Cancer Now. My name's Katie, I'm one of the clinical nurse specialists at Breast Cancer Now, and I'm joined today by two people. I'm delighted to introduce to you um, Mr. James Harvey, who's one of the oncoplastic surgeons at the Withenshaw Hospital in Manchester, and also um, my colleague Anna Lewis, who is part of our policy team um, at Breast Cancer Now. Um, Anna's here today um, to talk about, well, because we've just recently this week published a, um, a, re a re report on breast reconstruction, which has highlighted quite a lot of issues and may well generate some discussion. So she's here today to talk about that a little bit and to answer any questions that you might have related to that. And we will put a link to that report um, in the comments box below. And James Harvey tonight is here to answer any clinical questions about reconstruction. Um, of which we've already got quite a few, so I'm sure there'll be more coming in. So please do feel free to put any questions that you have tonight into the chat box below. Um, we will try in the next half an hour or so to get through as many of these as we can live tonight. Any that we can't get through um, this evening, um, we will reply in writing to tomorrow. Um, just be aware that um, the chat, anything that's put in the chat box is public, so um, it will be seen on Facebook. If you wanted to ask anything confidentiality, confidentially you can always do that either sending us a private message or sending us an email via our ask our nurse service on the um on our website or you can phone the nurses on our hotline on our helpline um which is open tomorrow morning from nine o'clock and the number for that is 0808 800 6000 but that link will come up soon as well so um tonight's um, topic is breast reconstruction um, and as I said we've already got quite a few questions coming through but um, I think it's quite important just to mention um, to begin with the um, reconstruction report that's just been published it has been um, picked up by the press so you may have heard a little bit about it already um, but it is talk it, it's highlighted the importance of breast reconstruction um, but also some of the issues that have um, are facing women that are going through reconstruction in today's climate. And I don't know, Anna, if you just want to give us a couple of sort of the, the highlights of the report, as it were, and, um, and then we'll move on from there. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. So um, as Katie mentioned, we published the report yesterday, but it's been a program of activity for breast cancer now over the past six months. Um, the basis of the report's kind of um, based on a survey of almost 2,500 people who have had breast cancer surgery or about to have breast cancer surgery, alongside us doing a freedom of information request to hospital trusts, but also engaging a range of healthcare professionals as well. So the report really highlighted some key issues for us. The first one was around patient choice. We really believe that patients should have the opportunity to choose the right surgery for them at the right time. But unfortunately, some of the insights of the report really highlighted the fact that patients aren't necessarily feeling like they're making a joint decision with their clinician. But alongside that, um, they're not necessarily getting all the information of all the different types of reconstruction they could have, which means that they're not having kind of been, being able to make an informed choice. And I think the statistic that we kind of found from our report was around um, six in 10, only six in 10 definitely felt involved in their decision making around their breast reconstruction. Um, the second thing that we found that there was um, limited opportunity in some areas of the country to access free flap reconstruction. And I appreciate that free flap is known by lots of different names, um, but essentially it's using tissue from another part of the body to um, provide that reconstruction for the breast. But unfortunately of the kind of um, only 40 hospitals across England actually provide free flap reconstruction. And there's challenges for individuals that aren't kind of being treated by a hospital that doesn't have free flap. Alongside that, some other issues that were highlighted in our report was around things like local restrictions, where particular areas restrict people in the amount of surgeries they'd like to, they can have, and the type of surgeries they can have, um, and the number of type of surgeries they can have, and then in what time frame. So there's some particular restrictions that create a bit of a postcode lottery. And then the last thing that we found was that obviously COVID has had a huge impact on services. Um, there were 60, roughly 60 percent less uh, breast reconstructions during kind of the first year of the pandemic. And that's also then um, meant that services haven't been able to recover. So we're now at a position where about 34 percent of service reconstructions are being performed less compared to the year prior to the pandemic, so 2018, 2019. Yeah. So that's just a bit of an overview of some of our findings and we can talk about the recommendations a bit later. 
yeah there's a there's a lot lot in there isn't there there's a lot to think about so um yeah um thinking about choice and um and 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 what's the best choice for for a patient um we we talked about um making sure that they have the right information um and that's something that um obviously tonight is a, a lot to do with as well so um we've already getting quite a lot of questions coming in which is brilliant um, Sabina has asked, um, first off, is what would give the best cosmetic result? Would it be a bilateral mastectomy with a Dieppe on both sides, or would it be a simple mastectomy with a Dieppe and a, with a Dieppe reconstruction and then a reduction on the other side? So, James, I don't know if you want to have a, have a go at answering that one. <laughs> um, I mean, there's, there's no right answer to these questions. I think that the key thing for all reconstruction discussions are that you meet with a surgeon, you discuss all the different options that are potentially available to you, mm. and you try and get enough information about each of the reconstructive options that you truly understand what it is you're getting into, how it's going to affect you, how it'll affect your family, what the recovery is like, maybe see some photos or be introduced to patients who've, who've had it done and have a real understanding of what the outcome of that operation is going to mean for you. And then for you to choose out of those options, which are going to suit me best. Clearly having a bilateral DEP is a much bigger procedure yeah. with, with larger risk than let's say have a unilateral DEP with, with a reduction on the other side. And the cosmetic outcomes are very different and the impact on you as a, as a woman sexually mentally physically are, are going to be are going to be different so um i think making sure that you're given that that information and 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 choice yeah thank you yeah and you're right it's absolutely down to your body shape as well isn't it and and um, all sorts of other things that may come into play when you're talking about reconstruction so it's really key to have that relationship with your yeah. with your consultant and also with your breast care nurse as well who should be able to go through those things with you um, and explain what's involved with each operation yeah and and part of choice is you know all choices should be discussed with you it doesn't necessarily mean that all women are suitable for all choices yes. um, so you might find that some choices are immediately let's say not recommended or it feels like they're taken away and you should seek if you if you want it a reason why those choices are not being offered and usually it'll be for a, a good clinical reason but if you feel it hasn't been offered there is a question which is fair to ask about and I'm not sure I was offered that or bringing up with the breast care nurse I'm not sure I was offered that was I offered that why can't why couldn't I have that and all fair questions to ask exactly and, and, and with with GEPs there's quite a lot of clinical criteria that you need to meet for that as well don't you because you do need to be physically fit and I and um, I'm right in saying aren't I that you don't like people to be to be smokers and um yeah. And, and anybody that's diabetic might be might be ruled out as well because of wound healing and things like that. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, I think there are several restrictions about DEPs. One is a resource restriction that mm. there isn't the resource for every patient to be offered a DEP reconstruction. It will depend on the area, the expertise in the area, the number of surgeons who are employed, their access to theatre space, all sorts of things. So there are restrictions because of service demand and then the second restriction will be around well if there's a limited resource we have to choose to do dieps on patients that are most likely to be successful so yeah. things that cause risk to patients like as you say smoking uh, a certain level of obesity will increase the failure rate and if you're going to have a certain number of operations in a year in a unit that we can do because there's a certain number of theater space we're probably best to choose patients that are going to have a successful health recovery yeah that's the reason why we, we have the clinical criteria. One is to, in a way, limit the number of patients who can have operations because there is a limit. And secondly, to try and ensure that you as a patient end up with a with a good outcome. Yeah. And the limit is what you've been talking about as well, isn't it, Anna? About, you know, there are places that can't offer DEPs because of resources, because of theatre time, because of surgeons and expertise in that area. Um, and that's something that breast cancer now wants to sort of campaign to sort of try and resolve, but it's not going to be an easy fix, is it? It's going to be something that's going to take a while to to come come through. But it's yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. So um, 
I'm just saying, Chloe had also asked a question about Dieppe reconstruction, and she'd asked how long it would take to recover from a from a Dieppe. And I know that again, that varies from person to person, doesn't it? I mean, yeah. generally, I used to say to people between six to twelve weeks. Some people it's less, some people it's longer. But there's, um, I don't know if you want to sort of elaborate on that and the reasons why. I mean, I mean, you're right, Katie. You've got experience with this, but. Um... Hospital stay wise, again, it will vary, but it will be somewhere between about three and seven days. Um, you're probably going to need some kind of support at home, you know, family member, um, partner with you for two or three weeks. Um, and then from there, it's just a slow journey of gradually returning. Probably by two or three weeks, you'll be doing social stuff, you know, going out for coffee, meeting friends, maybe going out with your partner in the car to meet friends, that sort of thing. Um, increasing your physical activity probably from about four weeks out and then really from four weeks to 12 weeks is just gradually feeling more comfortable it's your tummy that's the slow bit not your breast it's really mm -hmm. getting moving with your tummy straightening your tummy getting rid of the tightness in your tummy your wound healing coming back to normal feeling your strength come back um, and you know you, you know Katie but you're tired after it as well it it's a lot to recover from um, yeah, and just a big operation yeah so mental tiredness, physical tiredness, just they do take a few months. So I think realistically, you're right, probably three to four months for most ladies. Yeah. OK. Um, somebody else has asked a question about oh, we've got so many questions already. I'm trying to find where's the best one to go for. Um, so Sabina has also asked how long after um, a mastectomy and no dissection can you do a Dieppe reconstruction? So that would be a delayed reconstruction. Again, is, is that does that sort of vary from place to place? Or what would you what would your sort of um... I, th I think it will vary on lots of things. When get you. I guess the first thing is that you need to complete all your adjuvant therapy, what that whatever that is. So if you're having chemotherapy, that that would happen first, and then if you're having radiotherapy, that will happen next. Um, if you don't have radiotherapy and you've completed your adjuvant chemotherapy, you can pretty much have your diet reconstruction whenever they can schedule it for you. There's no clinical reason for you not having it. Mm -hmm. um, if you've had radiotherapy, it's slightly different in that there's an increased risk of failure after radiotherapy. So you will find that there's a variable delay before you can have your reconstruction. And it usually, the recommendation from your surgeon will sit somewhere between six and 18 months. The average probably being about 12 to say, we probably don't do it in the first 12 months, but potentially you could get teed up you know, prepared information wise so that you're ready to go by the end of that 18 month, 12 month yeah. period. Okay, thank you for that. that that's really clear. Um, Susan has said, I've recently had expanders put in. I hurt my arm and I needed an MRI. I went for the MRI and luckily the tech knew that I shouldn't have it with expanders because of the metal. Why don't the doctors tell us that? And again, I suppose that depends on the type of expander, doesn't it? Because not all of them have got, I, I suppose the expander Susan's talking about are the magnetic ones, but not all expanders um, have magnetic um, ports. Is that? Um, um, the, the, uh, there are variable brands of expanders. Some of them are MRI compatible. Uh, it's a common question that I get for my patients from MRI. Is this okay. expander MRI compatible? Some of them are, Becker's are um motiva implants are um but historically a lot of them of the integrated port expanders where the port is kind of within the heart of the expander they don't tend to be mri compatible so it's worth when you have your operation asking what type you've had and asking that question at that point because yeah, yeah it's you, not a blank it might not be and, and for Susan, I, I would say, you know, just check with your breast care nurse or your surgeon whether it is true that they're not MRI compatible, because some of them are, and you could still have an MRI potentially if they are compatible. Yeah. And often your doctors themselves, your surgeons with the best will in the world, often don't know the answer to that question. So it's quite common that we might ring up the manufacturer and say, I'm not entirely certain. Can you just yeah. clarify for me? Yeah. Um, Carol has said that she's been waiting for four years now to have her reconstruction. Um, why is it so many years before I can have it done? And um, I suppose that's something, Anna, that you've probably come across in your report quite a lot as well, haven't you? I presume there's a number of factors that will be um, because of that, COVID being one of them. But um, 
Yeah. Can you on that a little bit more from what you found in your report? Absolutely. So it was actually quite an interesting um, challenge for us because breast reconstruction, what we wanted to do was really kind of analyse the data and see what was going on. So um, we looked at hospital episode statistics and really, really looked at kind of what that waiting time period looked for people. And it's sometimes quite hard because, as, as everyone will know, there's immediate reconstruction, there's delayed reconstruction, there's different types. So us unpicking that data was, it was quite a challenge. But what we did find is that people were waiting a long time and obviously COVID impacted on that as well and when we did the freedom of information requests as well the variation that we found was quite interesting so for instance there was huge variation where services had started re restarted doing their reconstruction because uh, obviously they were paused during the pandemic so that's why some places it's taking them longer to get through it's also that some services aren't opening up to full capacity which was something a big issue that we found and as James mentioned it's because of theatre space it's not just mm -hmm. breast reconstruction that's got a backlog it's all different types of surgery and then obviously workforce is a big issue as well um and that's down to obviously the number of surgeons that are around but also looking at the whole multi-professional disciplinary team it's that you need that whole group in place for a reconstruction to take place and it's all of those factors that come together that mean that the, the pre pre and covid there was obviously a backlog and now that's only ever expanded and i think it's really important especially if someone's choosing delayed reconstruction that the length of time they have to, having to wait really needs to be considered because though some people may it may take four years for them to choose if they want their reconstruction it may be that some person has decided they wanted it within a year and then they've had to wait an extra three years and so what we really want NHS England to do is develop really monitor that what that weight actually looks like and really be able to assess that and really identify them where there are individual trusts or in integrated care systems where they are underperforming because at the moment that data we really had to do a lot of analysis to get that in place to really understand what that variation yeah. looks like and we think that that should be being done routinely at the national level because it has a huge impact on women doesn't it and I know Lisa's just sent in a message now saying she had her mastectomy in 2020 and she's been waiting for her reconstruction ever since just being told she's got to wait another year due to the backlog and she's devastated and we hear that a lot actually and we hear that a lot on the helpline as well and Lisa if you do want to talk this through and you feel that you do want to have any extra support please do phone our helpline um, because the nurses on the end of the phone there can listen to you and and can just give you some support there because it is we do recommend recognize that it is a very very difficult thing and it has a huge impact on people in all all parts of their life um, and that's one of the reasons that we've done this report isn't it to try and um, to try and highlight this and to get it recognized more yeah I think one of the big things that we wanted to get across to um, key decision makers was the fact that breast reconstruction is part of the journey it's not an add-on it's it's an integral yeah, part it's to part of recovery isn't it for absolutely. so many people yeah um, Anita has asked, um, how long does it take to recover from reconstruction and fat grafting without any complications? So I suppose that is that lipo modeling um, and fat transfer. Do you want, would you like to explain just what that is a little bit, James? And then we can explain how, how, yeah, how long recovery is from that. Sorry, it depends on what the question is, but lipo modeling itself is, is quite straightforward. It's just liposuction. So it's usually putting you to sleep, general anesthetic. Um, and then harvesting some fat from somewhere, usually tummy, thighs, bum, um, taking excess fat that you've got, just like liposuction you'd see for cosmetic reasons. And then we clean the fat up uh, with a filter or, or with a cleaning device, essentially wash it. And then we're injecting it in tiny little tunnels into your breast or your breast reconstruction or mastectomy scar to essentially just plump it out. And that can vary from let's say plumping out a lumpectomy scar where you might use you know 20 30 40 mils of fat to full on breast reconstruction with a, with a few hundred mils of fat so again it's not really the breast that needs a recovery it's it's where you harvest the fat from mm. so if you imagine um your surgeon is taking a big metal cannula you know kind of 30 centimeters long and is passing it through the fat in your tummy and how much bruising that's going to cause you that's the bit that takes the time for recovery so it's just really bruising to your tummy thighs wherever it comes from and, and it's probably going to last a week or two you're probably going to have a week of discomfort and then a couple of weeks of purple yellow then green bruising yeah yeah but it's not a major procedure 
No, it's a day case procedure usually, isn't it? So, yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 yeah, I'd expect okay. a big day case. Okay. Thank you. Um, so Denise has asked, can I have a reconstruction when I suffer from cardiomyopathy? Now, that's a bit of a, a tricky one. I suppose that would very much depend upon um, your pre-assessment, wouldn't it? Your pre-anesthetic assessment and, and what was what type of reconstruction Denise was thinking of. Um, yeah, I think it would depend on a lot of things. It, it will depend on the unit that you go to and their expertise. And you probably need to go to a unit that has obviously a, a good cardiology unit in there um and the hdu itu services you will need an anesthetic assessment as to what your risk is and that should be discussed with you about what's my risk of harm as in a complication and what is my risk potentially of of death and then for you to sit down with your surgeon and decide is is this a level of risk that the hospital is willing to give to you so they may say no or they may say potentially it's a yes, but discuss it with the patient. And then it's up for you and the surgeon to decide is that level of risk you're, you're happy to take. And again, it's the same thing we talked about before, isn't it? You should have a full understanding of what the risks are, the level of risks. And then it's a balance for you to work out what's the improvement in my quality of life versus what's the actual risk to me. And is that a risk that I am willing to take? And you will also have to find a surgeon who is willing to go on that journey with you and some may be willing and some may not be willing. And I'm sure they will be clear to you whether they're willing to take you on that journey. Yeah. There's no right or wrong. And it's it's a it's a scale, isn't it, Katie, from mild cardiomyopathy, where actually once you've had your heart test and your echoes, it's not a great problem through to that this is really not a sensible option at all. And I'm, and I'd strongly dissuade you. Yeah, that's true. So yeah, and it's all about informed consent, as you said. So um, just looking through here, there's quite a long one here. I'm just reading. Um, so Iveta said she had her surgery treatment and treatment during COVID with a tissue expander, and that migrated towards her shoulder. Um, because of the impact on my mental state, home life and work, the consultant fortunately swapped it for an implant. Um, this looks and feels odd. I'm waiting for a DEP, but I'm scared my expectations are too high. How do I access more information to see if my implant can be made better or to go for a DEP for the best outcome? I didn't get much information due to the pandemic. Gosh, so that's a bit complicated, isn't it? So um, how to get more information? I suppose the first port of call is your breast care nurse and then asking, asking to see the, um, the surgeon again to go through all the different options um i agree katie yep and managing expectations is a big one as well isn't it it's knowing you know knowing what that reconstruction is going to look like and and um and being prepared for that because at the end of the day when when you're having a reconstruction you're you're creating the shape of a breast but it won't be a breast um itself so it's managing that as well and being aware of that so that can be difficult as well Exactly. And delayed reconstruction with an expander is a very difficult thing to get a really good shape from because you've lost the skin. So once you've lost the skin, you're really just making a mound. You're, you're mm. not going to get the skin back. You're not going to get the natural shape back. So inherently, if you have an expander or an implant, you are really talking about symmetry in a bra. So when you're in a bra, bikini, whatever it is, um, the volume will be pretty much symmetrical nobody outside would know but as soon as you're out of a bra they're clearly going to be completely well not completely but they're going to be very asymmetrical given that one potentially is a natural breast and the other one is a i describe it as a dome really which is mm -hmm. the best way it, it's a filler it's an internal prosthesis in in that scenario and a, a diet reconstruction in that scenario would bring skin back in and soft tissue and give you a completely different cosmetic result but you have to invest in that. Uh, you have to invest in the recovery and, you know, everything that, that goes with that, really. So I think the breast care nurse is definitely the first port call. Um, they should get an appointment with the surgeon and discuss it. And I think the other thing, Katie, that, that we all know is that if, if you don't feel you're getting progress or, or clarity, you, you can ask to see somebody else and that, that's absolutely fine. You can go either within the service to somebody else or potentially to a different service and just get a second opinion if if you're yeah. not comfortable, which is also fine. Yeah. 
That's true. And and nobody minds if you do that. That's um, you know, that's part of the process, isn't it? To make sure that you're comfortable. Is that, is that a cat, Anna? <laughs> Joining in. <laughs> oh dear. Um Bal Balan Ray, I don't know if I Balan Ray, I'm not sure if I pronounced that correctly, has asked if it's best to have um reconstruction before or after, so I presume immediate or delayed, what are the pros and cons? And again, that's a very personal decision and lots of factors to play it, play into that. But um, where, would you, where would we begin with answering that question? Uh, fundamentally, if you have an immediate reconstruction, we are saving your skin. So potentially saving as much of the front of your breast as possible. That might just be the skin or it might be the skin and nipple. So if you have an immediate reconstruction, you're going to keep the skin and you're just going to change the filling, really. If you have an immediate reconstruction, we may be keeping the nipple as well. So it may be that the front of your breast actually looks exactly the same and we're just changing the filling. Whereas a delayed reconstruction, you're taking away the skin and the breast and left with a flat chest. So your reconstruction, if it's done with an implant, will never fully get that skin back. The idea of the expander is to stretch the skin to give you a bit extra. But you'll never get it to the level it was before or you have a flap where you bring it in skin from elsewhere as well as soft tissue to give you give you the shape uh, and the volume um if interestingly it's kind of a bit backward but if you look at quality of life of women who've had an immediate reconstruction it's higher if you have your own tissue but mm -hmm. not all want that uh slightly lower if you have an implant but but still good quality of life but if you look at women who have a delayed reconstruction, their quality of life is actually better than women who have an immediate reconstruction. But that's probably because they've had a, let's say, a dip in quality of life while they've had the mastectomy and they're, I don't know what the correct phraseology, but, you know, delighted that they've, they've got their reconstruction, yeah. they've got their breast back. So actually their quality of life ends up being higher. Right. Yeah. And that does make sense, actually, doesn't it? So, yeah. Interesting. Um. Ruth has asked, does reconstruction make it more difficult to identify potential recurrence or new lumps? And I've had another question along those lines as well from, um, yeah. from um, Nikki, would it be harder to spot a recurrence? Um, yeah, so... I think that's a really good question. We get asked all the time, isn't it, Katie? Mm. Like, I think... Um, Fundamentally, the answer is is no. You're not at increased risk. Um, the majority of cancers within the breast will be either kind of in the centre of the breast or closer to the front of the breast. The vast, vast, vast majority of recurrences—not that it's common—but the vast majority of recurrences, when they do come, will come in the skin. So whatever your reconstruction is, your reconstruction will sit behind the skin. So the the recurrence will come on the skin that you can feel as a little nodule. Yeah. Um, if you have a cancer where the surgeon is worried that it's, for instance, tethered to the muscle at the back um, or involving the muscle at the back, that's probably a scenario where there's slightly increased risk of potentially a recurrence coming back behind your reconstruction because you've got the muscle at the back and then your breast reconstruction, and then the skin on the top. So potentially if the recurrence came back on the muscle, which occasionally it does, that will be difficult for you to pick up and much more difficult for, for us to pick up. But that's quite a rare scenario, to be honest. And I think um, another thing to say really is if you're having a mastectomy and a reconstruction, the majority of that breast tissue is gone so it you, you know, it's not like you've got a breast that can have another cancer coming back in that breast although it's reconstructed it's not breast tissue anymore as well so it's just important that that's understood but yeah you're right I think this it's along the scar line isn't it that I would always say to people to look and, yep. and to be most aware um I've had a few questions about pain. So Jenny has asked, how long should I expect to have tenderness and nerve pain? And then I've had somebody else saying, I've, Anne has said, I still get pain on my reconstructed side after four years. Is that normal? <sighs> um, so what, what I tell my patients is obviously when you take the breast out, you are cutting all the nerves that supply your breast. We are literally cutting them. Um, so you have cut ends of nerves sitting there 
um, and they're gonna they're gonna let you know about it. So it is completely normal to have shooty pains, burning pains, sudden kind of catching pains um, for the first few months, yeah. uh, and it's normal that those pains settle over time and get less often but i would still expect you to have them six months out occasionally that will catch you and maybe even up to 12 months it's it's uncommon to have that sort of pain more than a year out but a few ladies do um and it depends whether we're talking about nerve pain or kind of tightness pain so ladies who have when we have radiotherapy the reconstruction can get tight or the skin can be tight and uncomfortable um, and that is something that if you have that tightness or discomfort, because it's a physical tightness in your reconstruction, won't, won't change, won't settle. So there are a proportion of women out there, for usually for radiotherapy reasons or surgery reasons of scarring, that that, that tightness or discomfort um, stays. Yeah. It's not common, but it can happen, can't it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and Tina, so many questions. I'm trying to keep on top of them all here. So Tina has said, I've had a single mastectomy. I would have preferred a double. And I'm left with one saggy, large, untamed breast. Do I have any choice of anything now? Yes. <laughs> you do. You do. You have a lot of choice. I think um, for most centers in the country, we are allowed to do revisional surgery and that might be revising your reconstructed side or it might be changing your other breast as in a, a breast lift or a reduction to match. Um, I don't think, from what she's saying, I don't think she's had a reconstruction on that side. So maybe it's to match uh, okay. the other side. But um, I mean, you, you, could, you could do a reduction on the, on, the, on the remaining breast, couldn't you? And then something else to match. Because I've also had somebody else asking about... Um, um, where is it? <laughs> I think the thing that's probably it was not... something very similar. Anyway, it was something about with if I've had um I've got one I've got a, I've got a large droopy breast. I think were the words that she used. Um, and it and it's I suppose in those situations maybe an implant wouldn't be the best operation unless we did something to the you did something to the other side at the same time or. Would you do it as a stage procedure or would you do it as a one uh, all, all together? I, I think that's going to be personal to you and the, and the surgeon and your risk factors and things. So there's there's no right answer to that. Um, I think you just have to make a decision on your surgeon's expertise um, and what, what they feel comfortable with. Yeah. Um, it might be one stage, it, it might be two stage. Um, for... I mean, the bigger your contralateral breast, if you've, if you've had a simple mastectomy and you've got no breast on one side, if you have a big droopy breast on the other side, you can still have surgery to reduce that so that you wear a, you know, a smaller prosthesis, your breast is more manageable. Um, the thing that inherently is not generally offered on the NHS is contralateral mastectomy surgery because it's seen as removing a healthy part of your body. So, mm. as, you know, we wouldn't routinely offer to take your ovaries out in case they got a cancer. We wouldn't routinely offer to take your other breast off if it's not cancerous and, and not at high risk. Um, and, and often that's an upsetting conversation for patients because they inherently feel that they're worried about the risk in the other breasts or they have anxiety about it. But unfortunately, that that's not going to be routinely funded in the NHS. And under you know current constraints of funding and getting patients into theatre, unfortunately there needs to be a concentration maybe on um, getting our cancer patients in and getting reconstructions going first of all, rather than concentrating on let's say a healthy breast. Um, Anita's asked about um, implants and specifically symptoms of breast implant illness. Um, and silicone leaking in her body. So what are the symptoms? What are the risks of implants with those two things? Okay, so a breast implant illness is, is without that a real thing. Um, it's essentially, there's an association between having a breast implant and certain symptoms, which, which vary, uh, but things like tiredness, uh, hair loss, um, change in mood, depression would be kind of, common symptoms of breast implant associated illness tends to be um, more common after kind of cosmetic implantation and less common after after breast reconstruction 
Um, I have had a few patients who have had breast implant associated illness. Um, and really, I guess the common factor is that those patients feel that the implants are impacting their health and they feel better once the implants are out. And if that sounds like you and you think you'd be better off having your implants out and you're convinced yourself that that's going to help you, then, then it, it may well do from the kind of evidence point of view of silicon there's actually very little evidence that silicon or a little bit of leaking silicon does harm uh, modern breast implants are made of a well more of a solid gel really so like like a, a jelly bear if you kind of cut it with a knife that the jelly doesn't just leak out all over the kitchen surface they're solid and it's the same with modern gel implants they are solid so even if you have a rupture the silicon is not going to be leaking everywhere you might notice a subtle change in the shape of the breast or the feel of it, but you're not going to have silicon leaking everywhere. 20, 30, 40 years ago, devices were very different um, and silicon could leak out, potentially go into your lymph nodes. Um, but that would be probably less common these days. So most often, if you, if you have a minor rupture, you don't have to have your implant removed. It would be a choice about what do you think, pros and cons. Mm -hmm. You want to have another surgery. So it's interesting, Anita had actually asked about the, the what she called it, the gummy implants, but that's the gummy bears, isn't it? So it's, um, is that safer than a different type of implant? For what you're saying, I suppose it's safer than the older types of implants. Um, yeah. But implants generally aren't unsafe. Would that be fair to say, do you think? I think that's right. I think there are some risks associated with implants. Um, there is a tiny risk of lymphoma of probably about one in 40,000 but then your risk of breast cancer inherently as a woman is about one in seven. Your risk of death from implant associated illness is about the same as your risk of death from a lightning strike in the UK. So kind of puts it in, in perspective. Yeah. It's not high risk, but, um, but it is there. Um, and there are multiple devices out there. Um, so older devices um, have a good period of follow-up so we know how they perform we know the risks we know the rupture rate and so on and newer implants obviously come on the market commonly and i guess the question for you and your doctor would be how long have these implants been around what evidence bases there around these implants what are the pros and cons what are the risks and your surgeon should be able to guide you as to what implants they're going to use and why they choose them yeah Thank you. I think I've just got one more question for now because I know we've been we've been talking for quite a long time and there were so many more questions and we will get back to to everybody. Um, and Michelle's just asking more, one more question on implants. I know um, my implants are more advanced now, but do they have a lifespan? And and they do, don't they? But that can vary again for for everybody. Um, what would you say the average lifespan of an implant was if it was put in today, for example? Um so the manufacturer's lifespan is uh, a lifetime guarantee. So they don't need to remo removing or replacing oh. unless there's a problem. Okay. And that will be the vast majority of implants. So uh, they do not need replacing unless you as a woman decide, I want them replacing. For instance, they become hard or uncomfortable or painful or there's evidence of rupture. So the only reason to replace them is if you as a woman think, I want them out. Either it doesn't look right anymore. The size doesn't match anymore. My body's changed around them, you know, and so on. Um, the other, the other one, Katie, I think there's an interesting question, kind of just that I've read through around choice of reconstruction being taken away after being told my cancer has spread. Oh, that was right at the beginning, wasn't it? Sorry, I did miss that one. Yeah. Um, that was Lauren, wasn't it? Yeah. Why was my choice taken away after I was told my cancer was spread? Yeah. And that's really difficult because that does. That does often happen. And once somebody has been told that their cancer has gone elsewhere in the body, often surgery isn't the, isn't the mainstay of treatment. Um, but I, I am, would you say that that is, doesn't necessarily mean the choice is taken away completely, depending on what treatment that she is offered and what, what type, where the cancer is spread to? Exactly. So, I mean, there's a few competing factors here. And it really, the, the decision should be made in whatever is in your best interest, Lauren. That's the bottom line. Mm -hmm. So it will be a team decision between your oncologist and you and probably a surgeon as well. Initially, when you're diagnosed with metastatic disease, your team might be worried about 
how fast is it going to spread what's your life expectancy should we be putting you through a procedure if your life expectancy is short however we all know now a lot of women are surviving longer not all of them but a lot of women are surviving longer and therefore actually they may be stable on systemic therapy for a prolonged period of time and actually their priority may be quality of life and that actually this is the one thing that will improve their quality of life of whatever life span they have left so um i think it would be important to find a surgeon who is sympathetic to your point of view and certainly your breast care nurse and surgeon are listening to what you're saying um and that you understand the pros and cons of the decision that you're making um it would be unusual. I think it's fair to say for a woman with metastatic cancer to have a reconstruction, um, but I have done them before. And generally there are women who are super delighted to, to have it done, but they are motivated women who will understand the risks. And for whatever reason, they're in a situation where having a breast reconstruction is very important to them. Mm-hmm. So it's personal. It's a very much personal circumstances, isn't it? In, in each situation is assessed on its own by itself, really. So again, have a chat with, with your breast care nurse, with your team, Lauren, if that's something that you want to, to pursue. And you can always, again, phone our helpline if, if you want to talk that through some more. Um, there are lots of other questions. Um, just, I think really, I, I could go on. <laughs> I'll just ask one more question while we've got you, and that's that's about um, chest wall perforator flaps. So Sharon had um, asked about if that's classed as a partial reconstruction. What does that mean? So, so perforator flaps are, are essentially taking a bit of tissue from the kind of side of your breast or underneath your breast and rolling it into your breast. Um, so usually it's in combination with lumpectomy type surgery. So traditionally we took a lump out and you might reshape the breast to fill a hole in the cake that you've just taken out if you like. But if you're taking a big enough piece of cake out, there's not enough cake left to reshape the breast. So you need to bring in a bit of cake from outside to fill the hole. So they tend to be partial reconstructions, the reconstructing part of the breast, not the whole thing. And it would depend really on where the cancer was that was being removed as to whether that would be possible as well, wouldn't it? Yeah, lower breast, central breast, outer breast are all good areas for for partial reconstruction. There also are only a certain number of surgeons who are capable of performing that procedure. So you may be offered it in your unit uh, or it may be a unit that refers you on to another unit, but I would say it's probably not universally offered. Thank you. Anna, there are questions for you. And Carly Ann has asked something as well um, about what happened to the government backlog. Um, would you be okay to reply to that one tomorrow? Or do you want, or is it something that you can do in a couple of minutes? I can do it in a couple of minutes. I think this is Carly Ann who really kindly shared her story um, with oh, us. And this is one of our yeah. fantastic case studies. So if you are the same Carly Ann, hi Carly Ann, thank you so much for sharing your story and your experiences with us. Um, so as Kylie and Anne mentioned in her question, one of the things we really want to do is make sure that the government, the backlog is addressed by NHS England Department of Health and Social Care. So one of the actions that we've taken as part of launching the report is writing to NHS England to ask if they can work with us, Backpress and ABS, to work to develop a plan to see how we can develop um, a constructive series of activity that reduces the backlog and ensures that there's access for reconstruction for anyone who wants it. Um, So we'll keep everyone updated on our kind of uh, Facebook pages, our campaigns pages and our blogs. And and we really want to bring everyone who's been on the journey so far with us to really kind of highlight the people who make the decisions about what happens in the NHS to really highlight that breast reconstruction is a really important part of kind of the experience of an individual's breast cancer journey and that it should be addressed just in the same way as any other service provision across the cancer journey is as well. Thank you Anna and thank you for for coming on today and talking about that with us because it's really important. Thank you for having Um, me. And thank you so much James for all your expertise and and the answering all those questions so well for us it's really informative and I hope you've I hope I'm sure you have answered lots of women's questions there 
Um, I hope it's been helpful to everybody. Um, please do, if you've got any other questions, you can still pop them in the chat box and we'll try and get back to you with the, with the answers. As I said, you can always phone our helpline, um, which is open again in the morning. If there are any issues that have been raised as a result of this, this um, um, presentation tonight, or um, if, you've, um, if you want to email any questions, as I said, you can go onto our website and access our Ask Our Nurse service and we can reply to you that way as well. Um, but everybody have a lovely evening. Thank you very much for joining us all tonight um, and take care. Thank you. <laughs>